Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining today's webinar, Turning Health Data into Useful Information, uh, the next in the series of webinars that Chris Apgar from Apgar & Associates and Data Motion are producing. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about social media, the responsibilities, and the way that's working with how data is moving in today's healthcare environment. I'd like to start today by talking about a couple of patients and looking at a clinical view and how we work with these different patients. Consider, if you will, a clinical patient review for a 16-year-old male patient diagnosed with general anxiety is being treated with an antidepressant, something like Tristique or something like that. Now, we know that from his clinical environment. Let's meet him as a person. He's 16 years old, pretty good-looking kid. He's on a swim team, only has a few friends, partially because he's in a rural area. He's kind of a loner because of that, but he's extremely active on social media. Now, remember, in our clinical description, we said he was on an antidepressant. If the physician had access to his tweets and his Facebook to know that eh, things aren't going so well and he's actually suicidal, we might have a different treatment plan and a different response. But the availability of that information isn't always, isn't always at the clinician's fingertips. Another one to consider, 46-year-old female patient with type 2 diabetes, standard treatment, metformin, insulin. We assume she's already gone through her dietary education and lifestyle improvement educations. But let's meet her as a person. I apologize for that. It appears my slides weren't moving. I think I've got that fixed now. Our clinical patient has, and I'm actually going to back up so you guys can see a see one of our other patients here. Just to back up here, here's our 16-year-old boy. And here are his tweets. So you can see how these tweets have an effect on his, informa on his feelings and how he's feeling about the world. And maybe it adjusts his clinical diagnosis and his treatment plan. We're back, 46-year-old female patient with diabetes and her treatment plan. But we might want to know socially that she's a single mom with three kids, high stress, lost her job, and wears an activity tracker. So maybe having some of this information, knowing that her Pinterest interests are all about food, she's not getting any of her activity in, and she's really depressed. This might have a tremendous effect on how she's treated, how her outcomes might, might move forward. In fact, in and out of the clinical space, we have two different, completely unique sets of information. Inside the clinical environment, whether it's an electronic medical record or a paper chart, we keep track of lab tests and, and all of the patient's information, prescriptions, and even their insurance company information. But out in their social world, in their non-clinical world, we have social media and the mobile apps that they use, their finances and, and lifestyles, and really everything about their their outer world, if you will. Journal of the American Medical Association had a tremendous article about data and information. Now, I don't expect you to understand everything on the screen, but I do point out that everything in the blue shaded areas is information in an EHR or clinical record. Information in the dark purple box is what's included in a bill or claims data to your insurance company. There's also a green box horizontally across the top that your, your pharmacy might have. But look at all the other information out there about a patient, about the person, about the life that they're living. All of this information has a, a direct impact on their world and is a feedback mechanism within their world that we don't look at from a traditional clinical environment. So what trends are we seeing in healthcare? What's changing? Well, one of the big changes we're seeing as we look at MIPS and MACRA and this move towards accountable care and outcomes-based medicine and, and really person-centric medicine and wellness is the need for better, better monitoring and compliance in patients, better ways and, and improved ways to increase outreach to our patients, educational support. And, and really support from their, their peers, someone who's facing a, a diagnosis of diabetes or cancer or hypertension needs that support to modify lifestyle, lifestyles to improve their outcomes. Social media in many ways is simply about community. So first poll question today, 
Our first poll question is, do your patients use technology for health? And if you're a patient, asking you directly, do you use technology for health? Let's activate this here. Let's launch that question. And the poll is open. I encourage you all to vote here. We'll give us a few moments to let everybody vote. And while you're voting, please know that, uh, yes, this deck will be available, and the recording of this presentation will be available to you after, this, after the presentation. We'll also let you know that the information from things like this polls is what helps Data Motion coordinate and provide feedback to you, our users, and our participants about the next information we're going to share. About 53% of you have voted. I'll give uh, just a couple more seconds for the rest of you to vote. No pressure. About five more seconds. About 60% of you have voted. Final votes coming in in five, four, three, two, one. Let's look at the results here. So our results show us that 76% of you said yes, your patients do use technology for health. 10% of you said, no, your patients do not use technology for health. And 14% of you said, you're not sure. Interesting statistics and pretty much what we found across the board. When we did a little survey, when a survey was done by World of DTC Marketing about consumers' use of mobile health applications, this is what we found. 32% of people communicated with their doctor uh, in using social media, using things like following them. They have social media apps for tracking physical activity or tracking symptoms. In fact, one of the most common uh, complaints that was heard in a physician-to-physician -physician symposium recently was the challenge of diagnosing a patient who's already self-diagnosed with WebMD. So we're really, we really are seeing this migration, if you will, from the traditional system-to-system -system communication, the traditional phone and fax communication, and even the messaging, messaging using direct secure messaging and email, migrating down t towards a more informal environment or shared environment in social media, communities, texting and chatting, ways of extending information and participating with patients, providers, caregivers, etc. So what do, what do we learn about all of this? Well, we've learned, for example, that health consumers are absolutely using social media. 40% of respondents to a recent survey in healthcare finance news said that they found uh, information on social media Im important in how they tr cared for and managed their chronic condition. 85% of millennials own a smartphone. Think about that. The rising population is dramatic users of technology. And one-fifth of, of all smartphone owners have a health app on their device. So that brings us to our next poll question. Do you have or use one of the following? So let me bring that poll question up for you. The polls are now open. Please let me know. And please feel free to check any one that you use. So it's not just if you have a wearable, but also apps, your social media. These are uh, casual social media, F Facebook, Pinterest, might also say uh, Instagram. Uh, casual social media might be something like Snapchat. Commercial social media is a little more formalized, LinkedIn, Google+. YouTube, smart wearables, Fitbit is the number one, but we're also saying Jawbone has a great one, GPS watches from Garmin for you runners out there, and mobile apps. And finally, do you use a patient portal from your uh, me medical providers? It would be interesting sometime to do a survey how many patient portals that you might participate in. One senior group and the AARP called it multiportalitis that many seniors were facing. About half of you have voted. We're going to give just a couple more seconds for all of you to get your votes in.
five more seconds. About 60% of you have voted. Three, two, one. Let's close the voting and see what our results are. So, as you can see, 72% of you use social media, uh, both casually and commercially. 12% of you are wearing smart wearables like a Fitbit. 52% of you, or half of you, are using a mobile app for health, and 72% of you are using a patient portal. So what that tells me is uh, those of you on the phone today are uh, active uh, participants in managing your own care using technology. So it stands to reason that we have to have a response for social media and the use of social media in healthcare. In fact, there was an interesting study that we found 56% of uh, users expect and demand their provider to use social media. That was an interesting statistic to me. I really under, found it fascinating that 56% of people wanted their provider to share information via social media for them to use. It was a, 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 a baffling statistic. There's even more statistics I think are very important because we're not just talking about the individual person or patient. We're talking about all the participants in care. 65.7 million formal, informal, and family caregivers provide someone uh, care to someone who's ill or, or disabled. 27.3 million family caregivers for, are personal assistants for someone with a disability or chronic illness. Uh, th these are amazing statistics and the number of people who are, are acting as a community to care for others require us to have a more global community outreach. This is another statistic I found fascinating. 60% of doctors say social media improves the quality of care delivered to patients. Think about that for a second. 60% believe that this is important. In just a moment, Chris Apgar is going to tell, uh, say it's absolutely important that we use it, but there has to be structure. There has to be designs around it. In fact, there have been there are guidelines out there. The, this great uh, article, "Take Two Aspirin and Tweet Me, Tweet Me in the Morning." as well as guidance from HHS about the use of social media uh, is critical to understanding and, and leveraging this, uh, this technology and this outreach using social media to remain compliant in our operations and, and, and how we share and care for our patients. So at this point, I'm going to pass the keyboard and mouse over to Chris. Chris, take it away. You know, we just talked about this before we got on about uh, figuring out how to get off of mute, and I just did it, and I, I have the simple way to do it, which is on my headset, so <laughs> I'm on now. Um, now I need to figure out how to, how to change the slides. There we go. What I'm looking, what I'm going to be talking about is sort of the balance between what I would call the laissez-faire, you know, everybody's got data everywhere, we're not really paying attention to it, they can do whatever they want to. On the other extreme, you have sort of the Orwellian environment where you have Big Brother watching over. So it's looking at the balance to provide better health care, but taking into account um, individual privacy rights and, and desires, as well as some of the legal construction that we have to pay attention to. So what I'll be talking about is the data transmission and the law. And, and then there are some things you look at, and, and just because it's legal doesn't make it right. Um, there are certain things that you can do. Um, the question is, should you be doing it? Looking at what consumers are demanding, um, sort of a how-to, how to reduce your privacy risks, and then when we get to the end, we'll be, have a, a summary, and uh, we'll, we'll have time for Q&A. Now, one of the things about privacy law um, is it's not necessarily easy. There's especially when we're focusing in the healthcare world. There's a lot of ambiguity in the um, privacy rule. Now, the Office for Civil Rights has been good over the last year or so in putting out additional advice around things like patient access rights and things like that. But we still have a lot of gray areas as we look look around and say, okay, what do we really need to do? Because then you also fold into state privacy laws. And then other laws like um, the alcohol and chemical dependency laws, which is 42 CFR Part 2. So there are a lot of regulations. We have sort of this alphabet soup out there, HIPAA, high tech, um, and ARA, and it, it just goes on. Um, so we have to be aware of what we need to do 
from a legal perspective when it looks at the umbrella of federal re re legislation as well as on the state level. And then it, it gets even more complex if you happen to be in a larger organization and you are um, encountering things like maybe you have a uh, business in Canada or over in the in the Europe, the international privacy laws are in a lot of cases more stringent than in the United States. And then you also need to pay attention to contractual requirements. As an example, in the state of California, um, the contractual requirements with California Medicaid or Medi-Cal is that if there's a breach of information, you have to notify um, the state within 48 hours. Now that's not a legal requirement, but it's in the contract. So if you want to do business in the state of California and in, in Medicaid, you need to pay attention to what the contractual requirements are. Now one of the things to do is you need to do is when you're looking at what am I going to do as far as finding a solution, say a solution that will help harness that vast information that Andy talked about um, in, in uh, improving patient care and preventative care. Um, you need to take a look at what you're buying before you buy it. If you're using something for the transmission of sensitive data, if you're pointing a patient to a mobile app and you're going to be using that information for, um, for say, preventative purposes, you really need to pay attention to that because there was actually a um, great uh, FAQ that was or put out there. There's really not an FAQ. It was a question that was posted on the OCR website that was, okay, I'm a doctor and I tell my patient, hey, I want you to use this particular mobile app and then I'll use your data to, um, as far as part of patient care. Now what happens if there's a breach at that vendor? Who's liable? Who's responsible for notification? That is somewhat unclear at this point, but it's, it's keeping in mind that as soon as you start using that data for patient care, it likely now becomes, in some respects, protected health information and under that umbrella of HIPAA. Now, one of the things to look at, too, is, is especially if you're on the, the development side, um, but even if you're not, if you're out there looking at mobile apps, take a look at the Federal Trade Commission's mobile app development tool. So it, it gives you sort of an idea of what the, the Federal Trade Commission is looking at when it's, it's, it will come in later as, as, as far as regulatory compliance and, and enforcement. One of the things that I've found, and we worked with a number of vendors and startups um, in, on the, the health information technology side of things and building mobile apps and things like that, is that a lot of times what happens is information security and privacy is an afterthought. They'll build it. It'll be cool. It'll be wonderful. It'll be a lot of fun. It'll be valuable. But there's not a lot of privacy and security baked in. And then when they try to do it in the end, it's sort of only halfway done. Um, so that's one of the things. If you're looking at the vendors and what they're, they're providing, um, and also, what if you're a vendor and you're you're developing this? You need to make sure that the privacy and security is baked in to that particular application. Now, if you're using the app or you're encouraging your patients to use the app, you need to keep in mind that the breaches are likely on you. You know that example that I gave about the doctor who's encouraging the patient to use the mobile app and then incorporating that patient information that's coming in. Say it's Fitbit, and that information is coming in and it's going to be used to um, determine what kind of preventative program that the, the um, healthcare professional is going to work with the patient on, is you need to look at that and say, okay, well now, as soon as I pull that information in under my healthcare umbrella, under my provider umbrella, now it becomes protected health information. So now you have to look at, they have a breach notification, state breach laws, contractual requirements, legal action, you got a breach, there's a chance you're going to get going to get sued, especially if it's a large breach. And the broader your customer base, the more complex it gets. As an example, I have a client who experienced a breach. Their their corporate office is in Connecticut. Their data center is in Virginia, and they're they're incorporated in Delaware. And the breach was in Indiana. So it was a matter of okay, now we need to sit down and look at all of the state laws and see which state law actually applies in this particular case. And it may be more than one state. In this particular case, it, it boiled down to the only state that was involved from a regulatory perspective was Indiana. But it it's, makes it complex. It's not a, oh, look at it, and I can, I can take action quickly. You need to evaluate which laws apply. Now, even though you may legally be able to do it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you should. You know, things that aren't protected by, by um, law and, and I'll put my caveat in here, which is 
if it's name, address, and so forth, and it's under that healthcare umbrella, it does become protected health information. But we'll say I'm a, a vendor and I'm collecting all this information. Say I'm that, that mobile app vendor and I'm collecting this, this data on the patient and I have in small print in my privacy notice that, hey, I may use this and sell it to somebody. Um, that make it right. And I would say that in some respects it's not. You need to in my mind anyway, you need to actively engage whoever it is, if it's the patient out there, and say, okay, do we have your permission to give this information to somebody else, whether it's selling it for marketing purposes or it's um, you want to do research and so forth. It's To me, it's a good idea to make sure that the patient is informed. One of the things to um, look at, too, is when you're looking at the payment card industry, um, it doesn't apply to everybody. But credit card protection should still be strong. So if you're collecting any credit card information, you should make sure that, that you are, as much as feasible, um, complying with PCI DSS, such as I'm not going to write down the, the CVC or security code on the back of the card, and I'm not going to keep that. Because that is, along with that card number, now you've got, sort of got carte blanche. You can take that card and buy whatever you want. Um, there is health data that's captured and transmitted. It's not necessarily protected by HIPAA. Good example, um, we'll go back to Fitbit. Um, I've got my Fitbit on my wrist and it tells me what my heart rate is and it tells me um, how far I've walked and how many stairs I've done and all of that. So it's, it's constantly monitoring my activity as far as my movement as well as my heart rate. Well, I'm not uh, doing this because I'm doing, uh, working with a healthcare provider on that. So Fitbit is collecting all of this information. Should it transmit that information to somebody else, or even as it's transmitted from my wrist to my phone to Fitbit, I would hope that that information is secure. Now, for me, if somebody learns that my heart rate is 90 beats per minute or 70 beats per minute, I don't really care. But there are people that do. Um, and especially when the data becomes more sensitive, such as when Andy was focusing on the, the boy with the mental health illness, that becomes very sensitive. And just because he's posting it out there on Facebook doesn't mean that you should be posting it somewhere where it's publicly seen. Now, it's also looking at what do you really need to transmit the information. This gets back to the minimum necessary standard and, and looking at, well, do I need to send that information? And if the answer is no, I really don't, then my advice is don't do it. Now here's my, the next polling question that Andy will be running for you is do you plan to use patient data from a social media and mobile apps for to implement preventative medicine program marketing or both? So this is more just to sort of get an idea of what would you like to do? Um, whether you're, you're doing it now or you plan to do it, if you see that there's a value in collecting that information, um, this gets a sort of get a feel for what your thoughts are around this. And the polls are open. Uh, I see about 20% of you have voted. While you're voting, I also want to remind everyone that there is a questions box at the bottom of your uh, go to meeting control, go to webinar controls. I'd love to have you put questions in there so Chris and I can answer those at the end of the uh, formal presentation. About 30% of you have voted now on this. It's a great question to think about. Do you plan to use this? It's not just uh, just about uh, uh, communicating out, but how do you plan to use it and what's your outreach plan? Uh, it's a really interesting idea. So I'd love to see the responses here. About, about half of you have voted now. I'll give it just a couple more seconds so we get the rest of the votes in. There's a wealth of data out there right now, and it, it's something that can add a lot of value on the preventative medicine side, but it's sort of a, a cautionary, um, there's a cautionary note of uh, beware of what you're doing. Absolutely. All righty. So I'm going to give it three more seconds. Still only about half of you have voted. I would encourage you all to vote. And if you're not a provider where, that would do this kind of outreach, uh, maybe vote on, on what your opinion should this be done just so we could uh, uh, get everyone to participate. Three or more, three or four more seconds, get everybody's votes in. And we'll go ahead and close the poll to keep, it, uh, keep progress going and just to share the information so everyone can see it. Uh, Chris, can you see the results? Yes, I can, thank you. Okay. So we have 20% uh, um, consider it for preventative medicine, 10% um, for marketing, 5% for both. 35% would not use it at all, 
for either, and then 30% don't know. I really appreciate you participating. This sort of gets the, the mind going as far as what thoughts are out there and, and how it can be valuable and use that information. Now, we'll go on to the next slide. Now, one of the things to look at is state health plan and hospital data should not be transmitted for non-research purposes, but it's happening. I'll give you an example. I got another client, and they're into healthcare marketing and research. They assist um, hospitals and large healthcare delivery systems in um, evaluating and, and trying to entice patients to come to their hospital or to come to their clinic, and also physicians to refer patients to their to their hospital. And what they are using, they're they're actually conducting marketing research, and they're using data from the states. In one case, it's a this all of the state. Um, intake data for all hospitals within the states, and it's not fully de-identified, and it's not fully a limited data set. The, in another example, they're using all of the, what, what a lot of people call the all claims, all payer database, which is a collection of all the claims that were paid within a state, and they're getting that, and it's, they pay a nominal fee to have access to the data. So now you've got the states actually sending information out to private companies that are using it for market research. Is that illegal? No, it's not. Um, do I, am I really comfortable with that? No, not really. Um, so, so it's happening right now. And it, it's not just a local occurrence. You're not just looking at what's happening within your particular environment in your, your organization. Privacy, especially when we're looking at social media and we're looking at tools and things like that as far as like Fitbit, that's something that's happening all over the place. As an example, if I go on vacation and I've got my Fitbit on, I live in Oregon and see I do, and this actually happened, I went to Costa Rica for to go scuba diving. Well, I'm now international and I'm taking all of that data that's being transmitted to um, Fitbit and to my phone and all of that. I'm going outside of the country. Um, what's the issue here? Well, it's just making sure that you're looking at the whole world. Where Where is that information coming from and what do you need to do to protect the privacy of that individual while still taking advantage of that wealth of data? And it, it's asking the question, who will be looking at it and should they be looking at it? And this is not as much a legal requirement as it is when you're looking at it from a protected health information perspective, but it's looking at it a little more broadly. Is do I really need to look at that information? Is it really going to add value to what I'm doing? So it's, it's looking at making sure that you're also preserving the patient's rights. We're in a world now where patients are eager to use these new tools to help them through their day, whether it's exercise or it's managing diabetes, whatever it happens to be, is it's looking at all of that and it's taking advantage of that information but doing so in a way that's sensitive to the patient's um, privacy because the patient still wants their privacy. They aren't out there saying, hey, just use my information and, and do whatever you want with it. Now, um, could you move the slide, please? It's frozen on my end. There we go. Thank you very much. Um, now, some of the things that consumers are demanding, and I was touching on a little bit, is privacy, you need to look at it from the eyes of the patients. What are they looking for? Um, there have been, um, I can't remember the, the name of the article, but there was an article that I read um, a few weeks ago that, that basically said, you know, if I'm a patient, you breach my information, I'm going to go to somebody else. So it's, it's preserving the privacy of the individual, but it's also looking at, do you want to stay in business? Because if you breach that trust of the patient, there's a fair likelihood they're going to go find, they're going to take their healthcare business to somebody else. Um, if you're not, if you are not comfortable trans having somebody else store your data, patients are not to, to be happy either. It's one of those where um, looking at it from the eyes of you're the patient and what are you comfortable with, um, and and then adding a little bit to it and say, okay, well, I may be comfortable sending this information, but I don't know if the patients are. So it's looking at it, looking at it from the view of I am the patient and what am I comfortable with. Privacy is big, big news around the world. I see this a lot. I get the um, emails from the, the briefings from the International Association of Privacy Professionals, and this is really a big deal out there, whether it's looking at what the consumers want, um, as far as privacy is concerned, it's looking at a lot of the legal issues that have been going on around privacy um, in the United States and abroad. Um, consumers will hold you to certain expectations. They expect you to 
yes, they may want you to use their social media feeds um, to help them out, but they also want to make sure that you're not using that in a way that will breach their privacy. It's sort of like you know, the situation that I, as the patient, may be just fine and dandy, happy to post my half of my medical record on Facebook, but that doesn't mean I'm going to be comfortable with you as the provider or the, the um, vendor posting my information on Facebook. As I said, if trust is lost, patients are going to go someplace else. And this is true whether you happen to be a healthcare provider, whether you happen to be a health plan, whether you happen to be a, a vendor or a business associate. If they're not comfortable with what you're doing, if they believe that you've invaded their privacy or you've breached their privacy, they're going to take their business someplace else. And again, as I noted with Facebook, they may not be private with their own data, but they expect you to be private with their data. There are a lot of lawsuits in the news, especially as it relates to breaches. Um, it's, it's one of those where if their information is out there and they believe they may be harmed, they're going to be more than happy to join that class action lawsuit. The other thing that happens, too, is it's a damage to brand. In other words, you're tarnishing your reputation as a, in, the, in the healthcare industry, and once that reputation is tarnished, it takes a long time to get that, um, that all the way back. Um, so it's, it's one of those that if, if you can't ensure privacy and you can't um, communicate the fact that you will be protecting their privacy, they're not going to trust their information with you. Now, what do we want to do to reduce the privacy risks? Well, first of all, start at home. What is your data? What do you have? Do you know where it's at? Do you know where it's stored? Do you know where it's transmitted? That's a good place to start, is to figure out where that sensitive data is, what you're using it for, what applications are they in, is it being sent out over the internet, um, is it being encrypted, is it not? Then educate your staff. One of the big risks out there, in fact, if you look at it from the perspective of the, the sheer number of privacy and security incidents that occur, more often than not, the cause is from within an organization. It's not malicious, necessarily. It's somebody forgets and they plug in the wrong fax number, or they send an email and encrypt it, or they, don't, they store information on a USB drive and they lose that USB drive. It's educating the staff as to what their responsibility is. And here's also an opportunity where you could turn it around to and say, OK, staff, you are patients yourselves. What are your expectations? And think about what you can do to protect your own privacy. Things like encrypting your phone, um, not storing sensitive stuff everywhere, making sure that you're careful as far as um, those links that you click on, because you as, a, as an individual don't want to be harmed. So we're asking you to do the same thing for the organization. Policies and procedures. That Policies and procedures do a number of things. You, the law says you've got to do it, um, especially if you're under HIPAA. Um, it's expected by your customers. It's also a very good educational tool. If you've documented it and you have you use it, not just say hand this this huge thick book to the employees and say here go read that, and you actually walk through what they're responsible for on the policy and procedure side of things, it becomes an educational opportunity. It also reduces your legal exposure. If you can demonstrate and document that you're doing the right thing, yes, you still may be sued, but you likely not going to lose if you can prove that you are doing the right thing. Conduct your privacy and security risk assessments. It's a good idea, and this guess the HIPAA security rule says you've got to do a risk assessment. It's looking at it from the perspective of what is my exposure? What are my risks? What are the things that I may be able to do to prevent something from happening that would result in a breach of privacy? So it's making sure that you're looking forward. This is what I call a proactive approach or a preventative approach to privacy and security. It's looking out there and saying what are the risks before something bad happens and then doing something about it. Assess your security, but also assess your vendor security. You don't have any security, you don't have any privacy. They go hand in hand. You can, and it's one of the things, funny things I've seen in, in the healthcare industry over the last couple of decades is Privacy is, is somewhat cultural. It's, it's part of healthcare. On the other hand, security is not. And, and there's sometimes this gap of understanding in that if you don't have good security, there is no privacy. That information is just out there. Now, when you're looking at your vendors, it's looking at it not from just the perspective of, OK, I'm going to go contract with somebody new, or I'm going to use a new mobile app. It's looking at it on an ongoing basis. Just because everything's okay the day you sign that contract doesn't mean it will be okay a year later. 
So it's a good idea, especially if they're critical vendors for you, to ask a question as, as you move forward in time and send out like a, a short questionnaire. Have you updated your policies? Do you do training? Have you done a risk analysis? That does two things. It's due diligence. It also can show you if there's a red flag that you need to follow up on that may be putting your data and your patient's data at risk. And it's really security starts at home. You're looking at education of your employees, hopefully your patients also. When you're, when you're looking at, um, like as an example, you're rolling out a patient portal um, and there, your patients are being able to access it, it's a good idea to put some tips out there on, you know, don't share your password and things like that. Um, now, you're not going to be able to control what the patients do, but you can at least educate them. It's implementing. If you say, I, you know, you conduct that risk assessment and you discover the risks, it's implementing solutions, enhancing your security controls, um, putting in place new policies and procedures, training staff. So it's implementing those tools that will help preserve the privacy of the individual. This is one of the important things is documentation. When you're looking at it from a regulatory perspective or am I going to get sued perspective, the, the better documentation that you have, the more centrally located it is, the better off you are. And if there are any of you on the call who have received the wonderful OCR HIPAA audit pre-audit survey questionnaire and you've looked at the, the audit protocols that are out there, you will understand very quickly that if you're going to survive an audit from the Office for Civil Rights, you darn well better have good, solid documentation and be able to get at it really quickly. Then you start all over again. After you've done all that, you've educated, implemented, and so forth, is this is not a one-time thing. This is, is an ongoing exercise. One of the things that I would also like to, to um, push is, uh, have you conducted a mock phishing exercise? There's some good vendors out there that you can take advantage of and not for a huge price tag. It's a way to measure you know, how, how your education around clicking on the wrong links has, have, has it sunk in with your employees. So if you conduct a mock phishing exercise, you can um, find out who's going to click on that bad link. And then that provides you another educational opportunity that hopefully will reduce your risk even more. You know, you're never going to get everybody. There's always going to be one or two people in the mix that it doesn't matter what you do, say, um, what your actions are, they're really not going to pay attention and something bad may happen. But this way you reduce that likelihood that it's going to harm your organization and you're reducing the likelihood that it's going to harm your patients. And as I indicated, you, you evaluate your vendors before and after you buy. It's really important as an, as an ongoing practice to say, okay, I'm going to bring in somebody new. I need to vet them. I'm going to also look at them on an annual basis, especially if they're critical to your operations. Audit your business associates and business associate subcontractors. Now, this can sound like an overwhelming process, but it's again, it's targeting in on, say you've got 20 business associates and only eight of them are really key to your business. Well, those are the eight that you would focus on. Yes, you need to um, demonstrate due diligence for everybody, but you really need to pay attention to the ones that can harm you if things go south. And make sure you follow up. If you get something in the door and it says, hey, this, this vendor has not doing the right thing here, and you just say, okay, and file it away, well, now you've just created a situation which, where the OCR would likely find willful neglect because you knew about it and you should have done something about it. The other thing is that if a vendor can't guarantee it, find another vendor. And in a lot of cases, there are other vendors. Yes, there are exceptions to that. Like, say, if you're, we, were, <laughs> we were commiserating about Office 365 before we getting on the call, um, and if you're if you're been using Office for a long time, you're sort of stuck with it. Um, and yes, there's patient information there. So there are those situations where you're sort of going to be stuck with the vendor, um, like if they're the only game in town. But in a lot of cases, they're not. Um, so if you're looking at um, s different solutions, make sure that you you dig a little deeper. I mean, one of the things I love is I'll go out on the web and I'll, I'll look at vendor sites, whether it's a mobile app or it's a um, some other form of solution, and, and all, all over the website will be, we're HIPAA compliant. Um, what's even worse is are the ones that say, we can make you HIPAA compliant. And it's like, no, you can't make me HIPAA compliant. I'm going to run as fast as I can. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to get away from you. You may be able to help me, but you can't do it for me. So it's looking at just because they post it on their, on their marketing, in their marketing material that they're HIPAA compliant, it doesn't mean much. It, it may mean that their technology is, will fit within the framework of HIPAA, 
but it doesn't necessarily mean they've got good physical security or they've got they've got good policies and procedures or administrative safeguards in place. So it's digging a little deeper than just looking at that what's on their website. Third party attestations, it's a good idea to look for that if you're looking for a vendor. And and what I mean by that is um, whether it's a, a SOC 2, it's high trust, it's coming to a vendor like AppGuard and Associates and, and we do the assessment and we provide you an attestation that as of X day you're, you're, you appear to be compliant. Those are the things to look for from your vendors. It's becoming more and more common and I'm seeing a lot more market pressure out there on the vendor community to say you need to have somebody take a look at what your operations are so that I've got a, a, a higher comfort level that you're actually protecting my information. Now, one of the things that I mentioned, the OCR um, audits that are coming up, if you, if you want to um, really get a headache, uh, go look at the audit protocol. Um, it is rather intense and it's rather in-depth and there, there are some um, not really clear parts of it. So it's, it's one of those that just take a look at it. Um, if you haven't received your pre-audit letter, you're probably not going to get audited in round one of phase two audits, but it's a good idea to be prepared. What may happen down the road is OCR may also use that protocol and breach investigations and complaint investigations. What happens if, if you do have an audit? Well, OCR, excuse me, if you do have a breach, if it's a breach of 500 individuals or more, there is close to 100% chance you will get a letter from the Office for Civil Rights um, and your name will go up on the wall of shame. But you'll get that letter and it will say, I want a copy of all your security policies and procedures. I want a copy of your risk analysis. I want a copy of your uh, what you did to mitigate your investigation documentation, and then what are you doing to make sure it doesn't happen again. The OCR also conducts complaint investigations, and they do investigate those. It may take them a while. Uh, it may take them a few months to get back to um, the covered entity and, and, and actually investigate, but they do investigate. So you need to be prepared for that, that they will show up on site. The Federal Trade Commission has gotten into the Act, too. We see headlines where the FTC is going after um, entities and levying penalties because they, you know, it may be that they, they said something in their privacy notice they have on their web page, but they do something totally different with the data. That's the kind of thing where the FTC will step in. State Attorney Generals, they also investigate, and they were given the power to, in essence, enforce HIPAA through the federal court system um, as part of the High Tech Act. The other thing as all part of this is prepare for litigation in advance. It's sort of like the the audits. Um, it may not happen to you now, it may not happen to you in, in the next 10 years, but there is always that possibility. If there is a significant breach of information and you happen to be involved in it, you can probably count on being sued. Now assess your customers. What are they demanding? Talk to your patients, your health plan members covered entity customers, business associate customers, and so forth, talk to them and ask them what they want. Assess what they're demanding. Um, patients, they may be saying, hey, I want you to use my information that I'm putting on social media or you're collecting through Fitbit or some other form of, of fitness application, and I want you to help me with wellness. But I want you to be darn sure that you protect that information and you don't let anybody else have it. The same will be true for covered entity members, health plans, and so forth. It's also, as you, if you're the business associate, it's asking your covered entity customer what their ex expectations are. More often than not, they're going to clearly articulate them. But I have had seen situations where whether I'm brought in to work with a covered entity or the business associate where that just doesn't happen. It's just not communicated. <clears throat> and you need to plan to meet their, their, the consumer and the customer demands. That's what keeps you in business. That's what enhances healthcare, the preventative healthcare side of things. That's something that you can you can help expand the, the use of this data for um, healthcare, especially preventative healthcare purposes, while at the same time protecting the privacy of individuals. Developers, if you're a developer, as I said with the vendors, they haven't they haven't really baked it in. It's making sure that you are baking it in. Because it's a lot easier to address privacy and security up front. It's it's far more difficult to totally re-architect something because you didn't think about privacy and security to begin with. So it's easier to do it first. Now, if, if you do happen to be the developer or if you, if you have insomnia and you want to read something that will put you to sleep for sure, is go check out the NIST guidelines, um, special publication 800-163. That's specifically focused on mobile app development. If you want to stick around, if you want to stay in business, you need to protect the data. This is more than just a regulatory requirement. Over the last, since I believe about 
2010 or so, and this is just my um, observation, is I've seen a, a significant growth in the amount of market pressure that's being brought to get, bear on um, entities and saying you really need to take into account privacy and security if you want to um, stay in business to the point where um, I have clients who had to prove that they were HIPAA compliant and they had good privacy and security to get that next round of investment as they were growing their company. Now, as far as resources, I like to give you something to walk away with. There's a great article. It's in Wired Magazine. It's the Privacy Revol Revolt, the Growing Demand for Privacy as a Service. And the next is the 2015 State of Consumer Privacy and, and Personalization from Gigia. Um, you do need to sign up for that. It's just a matter of giving them their email address, and, and then you can download that, that white paper. Um, and the other is um, PPR. It's Privacy Laws by State. So it just sort of gives you a high level. What are the differences between states? Because there is a, a, a sort of this patchwork of laws across the country, whether it's privacy or it's breach. Federal Trade Commission, there's a good piece on um, protecting consumer privacy. Office for Civil Rights, just on, on privacy in general. Um, and this is a great website. It's the National Council of State Legislatures. Um, it's, they have a, a one web page you can go to, and you can access all state breach notification laws. And the great thing about it is because this is an organization of state legislatures, um, it, they keep it up to date. So you can see all the, the changes, because there have been a number of changes over the last year or two. I know that in Oregon, they totally revamped the breach law and made it significantly more stringent as far as the thing that they're looking for that would make it a reportable breach. Now I'd like to um, open it up for question and answer. Absolutely. And Chris, thank you so much for, for uh, uh, your participation in this webinar. It's, uh, it's always great to, to, to have you on there. Uh, we have, actually have a, our first question was from one of our, uh, one of our participants uh, talking about Fitbit being a HIPAA compliant um, device and application. And, you're at, and the, the, just the, kind of the dialogue on that is absolutely. Hit, Fitbit actually uh, partnered with a number of organizations to ensure that the information that they provide and that they gather is HIPAA compliant, it, that their, their uh, communication between the, the device and the phone or the device and, the, and your laptop or, or a computer, uh, it was that, that was encrypted and the information was delivered in a secure manner and access to that information is also delivered securely. Uh, a great example of a company followed Chris's advice to, uh, to build security and privacy in immediately. My, my cautionary note on that is, I'll give you an example, um, AWS or Amazon Web Services, huge public cloud, and you can build a HIPAA compliant environment in Amazon, but not all environments are HIPAA compliant. So Fitbit has entered into the world of healthcare in the sense that they're, they're now saying, hey, I can be your business associate and I can help you out, but that doesn't mean all of the activities that Fitbit does is, quote, HIPAA compliant. Absolutely. Our next um, uh, uh, next question comes from Paul, and he's asking, uh, can you speak to HIPAA and the rules as it applies to collection agencies? Chris, I'm going to let you take yeah. a, a crack at that. If the collection agency is, we'll say the collection agency is working for a hospital or working on behalf of a, of a clinic, they become a business associate of that clinic or hospital. So they then fall under the umbrella of, um, they have to comply with all of the security rule and the use and disclosure provisions of the privacy rule. So that's that's really one of those where it, it can, you can clearly look at it and say, okay, if I'm hiring somebody to collect um, bad debt for me and to, to try to recover my money, they become your business associate and they have their own obligations under HIPAA. And then you also need to make sure that business associate agreement is executed. You don't want to find yourself in the news like a couple of entities over the last month or so who have been fined because they didn't have a business associate agreement in place. Fantastic. So we have a question here specifically about e-marketing and, uh, and outreach to patients using email. Um, I'm going to start with this one, and, and I'm going to let you kind of run with it also. Um, okay. So e-marketing is, is a very interesting thing. We see it a lot of times in insurance companies and in hospitals that are out, uh, reaching out to specific uh, groups of, of individuals. The key to uh, kind of recognizing HIPAA and, and uh, HIPAA concerns is any time you associate an individual with a condition. So if, I send, if you send an email to a group of people, you're identifying them in the two field, and then 
in the body it says, to help you treat your diabetes, pretty much guaranteed you're, you're exposing information you shouldn't be exposing. And so you have to consider what solutions are available to you. Companies like Datamotion have, have ability to send secure email and things like that. Uh, but uh, evaluating how the outreach and why you're reaching out uh, is a critical component. Um, Chris, any further thoughts on that? Yeah, it, it's one of those where it, it's also looking at it from a, a quote marketing perspective and what's, what is marketing under HIPAA and what's not. Um, as an example, if I send an email out to the community, um, I've got um, individuals' names and addresses, not necessarily because they came in as patients, but because they're part of a community. And I send an email blast out saying, hey, we just opened this new wing of our hospital, or here's some wellness opportunities that you can take advantage of, such as uh, blood pressure screening and um, asthma screening, diabetes screening. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that because it's very general. It's not targeting an individual and saying, hey, you got diabetes, therefore you should come to this workshop. So it's being very careful. It's also you could send out, as long as you're not targeting individuals, you could send out, say, a flyer on, on how to control diabetes. What are some of the tips? As long as you're not targeting a group of patients. You know, it's, it's okay to target that group of patients and say, you've got diabetes and I've got a free workshop for you. The, the added layer of concern comes in, as Andy noted, is if you're transmitting that information electronically, it's a good idea to make sure it's protected. Because if you're sending it out specifically to a group of, of patients that you have that say have diabetes, and you're communicating to them that here, here's this um, great opportunity for you to come, to come to a free workshop, you're not selling anything. So that's okay under HIPAA. But now you're exposing their information potentially from somebody who can intercept that email message. Great. So we have another question specifically about texting. So uh, with the world of texting always becomes very questionable when it comes to what the compliance requirements as well as, uh, as well as the interoperability requirements of texting. So the first part of the question is, uh, as a nurse, what are the guidelines of texting a wound photo to a physician? And uh, the follow-up component to that is, what is the supporting documentation and, and where can I find that supporting documentation? I'm at, Chris, I'm going to let you start with that one. <laughs> texting is one of those unusual or this, one of those things that as I was at a, a, a little comedy conference and the CTO for Stanford University was there and he's, somebody said, well, you can, you can start with doing texting. He said, no, that one's out of the barn. That's, that train is down the tracks. You're not going to stop texting. It's going to happen. Now, up until the last year or two, there really hasn't been what I would call a really good tool out there to support secure texting of information because most of the tools out there, you had to have their application installed on your device in order to actually receive that. And in, in a lot of cases, too, you actually had to subscribe to that before you could um, receive that text message. That's changed. The technology has changed. And I think it's now it's looking at what the solutions are out there. And if you do need to use texting for um, say patient information, say that the picture of that wound, it's looking at those secure solutions so that you can um, secure the information that you're sending, say if it is a wound, so that it's not intercepted. Um, as far as documentation, um, there really isn't a lot. Uh, OCR has focused on email and they focused on uh, mobile device encryption, but there really hasn't been a lot of information put out about texting and what the regulatory requirements are. And the way I would look at it is it gets back to the same thing that OCR said in uh, February of 2014 when they said that, guess what, folks, email, um, if you encrypt, if you don't encrypt email, you can have a problem because we consider encryption a reasonable safeguard. We're getting to that same point with text messaging where finding a solution to secure that message is reasonable. So it's making, it's keeping that in mind when you're looking forward. If you do need to text information, it's using the minimum amount of information necessary. As an example, if I'm going to use text messaging to remind a patient of an appointment, it's just saying you have an appointment with, with your doctor, just being careful to, you know, if it's, it's something like a mental health condition or something like that, is being a little more careful as far as what you're texting. But it's, it's, it's looking at reducing the amount of PHI you text, and it's also looking at what are the solutions, just like a secure email solution, I'm going to look for a secure texting solution. I'll add on just a little bit to that, and that is that uh, when you evaluate the use of something like texting, 
You also have to consider your responsibilities for uh, for for managing that information and and protecting that information. Are you being a good steward of that information? Was it, I was involved in a very interesting lawsuit where a nurse claimed uh, that she texted a complete record of what was going on with the patient asking for a provider to uh, authorize dispensing some medication. The provider claimed that, that he received a request, can I give this, without any f background in information. And so the, the provider said yes in the text, the nurse um, gave, the, gave the medication, and the result was not a positive outcome. So when you're using texting, there's not a lot of documentation trail other than the text was sent and received. So it's also about evaluating being a good steward for that data and what is the functional expectation of, that, of the use of that information. Texting, as, as Chris said, a reminder about your appointment on Tuesday, uh, texting to, to say, say, have you checked, uh, you know, are you following your, um, uh, the plan we set as part of a care coordination outreach, um, even an outreach that says, how are you doing? via text to open a conversation between a care coordinator or a care extender and the, uh, and the patient is probably okay. But when you start crossing into the telemedicine dialogue for, for discussion, now you have to have some controls there. So I, I hope that is uh, some, some information there, but it's certainly a, yeah. a challenge. Well, one of the things, so, it's, it's sort of like we're, we're changing the, sort of the, the way we communicate. I've got my kids, um, all of which are grown, are the, the quote, millennials. And um, if I really want to get a hold of my kids, I'm not going to call them. I'm not going to email them. I'm going to send them a text message because they're going to look at it. Absolutely. And that's why, that, that's part of why this webinar was put together today is to start opening the dialogue about, about social media. And to recognize that as an industry, we have to start addressing this idea of community, addre addressing the, the avenues and expectations of those users of social media. I want to thank you all for attending today's webinar, uh, and especially Chris Apgar uh, and Apgar Associates for their part uh, continued participation with Datamotion. Um, Chris is a fantastic resource, and I would encourage all of you to reach out to Chris if you have any needs. I would also like to, uh, I've been asked to make sure that I share the slide of sources. I used a lot of statistics in today's webinar, and uh, when you look for the slide deck on, uh, online as part of the, uh, after this webinar, you'll be able to find all of the resources that those statistics came from. Any final thoughts, Chris, before we sign off for the day? I think we have a, a lot of opportunities out there. So I do a, a webinar every now and then called Risks and Rewards on, on the HIT market. And we have a great opportunity out there. It's just making sure that as we take advantage of those opportunities and we improve healthcare for um, citizens in the country, that we're very careful about making sure that that information is being protected as, as it is necessary. And I'd also like to thank everybody for participating today. And I'd like to thank Andy. Um, this has been a, a good opportunity, I think, for uh, uh, to start the discussion, as Andy said. Absolutely. Well, thanks, everyone, again. Appreciate your time, and uh, have a tremendous day.